Welcome to Nigeria Newsmakers. I'm your host, Douglas Burton. On September 5th, we sat down with the embattled governor of Benue State, His Excellency Samuel Ortum. Governor Ortum administers the state at the center of Nigeria and the epicenter of its conflict. Uh, we are really privileged to have a elected official from the state which is considered by many to be the epicenter of terrorism in Nigeria. And Governor Ortum is in Washington. We are at a location close to the White House and close to national security officials who may want to talk to Governor Ortum. And on this Labor Day uh, holiday, we're really privileged uh, to meet with you, Governor Ortum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governor, Americans are concerned about Nigeria. Everybody knows that there's a conflict, and it's, it's been widely said that there is a onslaught against religious minorities. There's even a genocide against Christians. And Americans have heard about insurgencies like Boko Haram, which means Western learning is forbidden. They may have heard about other insurgencies, and they may have heard about massive killings and massacres and cleansing of villages by so-called bandits or unknown gunmen. Can you put in your own words, what is the conflict in Nigeria about? Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the privilege of uh, sharing with you my uh, thoughts and about what is happening in Nigeria. I've been the center of it. Um, I've been governor since uh, 2015 to date. I did my first tenure, which ended in 2019, and uh, the second tenure will end in 2023. And before then, I've been minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I was a local government chairman from my local government, and I've had several other party posts. And so I've been around for a while. And I'm very conversant with the issues because I took time. As a born-again Christian, I took time to pray and also had some revelation about what is going on. And I also made some research about what happened right from uh, 1800, mm -hmm. and specifically what took place in 1804 right in Benue State, uh, where our forefathers stood against the jihadists and fought against them, and were able to bring them down. And Benue State was able to stop the jihadists from proceeding to the south. Mm. It was right there in Benue State that um, we defeated the jihadists, led by Otman Danfodio in those days. Uh, now, I must say that whatever you hear in America here about uh, what is happening in Nigeria, some people have the narrative that it is farmer headers crisis. Yeah. It's not so. It's a dummy that has been sold to shield people away from knowing the truth. Now, can you, can you explain to us, what is farmer herder crisis? What, what does that refer to? Uh, that is why I'm, I'm disputing it, because it is not. But the narrative out here in America, I've been to Europe. I've also heard people tell me it's farmer herders crisis, right. because most of the people who are killed, most of the people's homes who are destroyed, are farmers because the insurgents coming from these jihadists, they go to attack villagers. So not really in the urban areas. Mm. And, and so farmers live in the rural areas to do their farm. And is Benue a majority Christian state? Because Nigeria is roughly split between Muslims and Christians. Of course. The northern part of the country is chiefly Muslim. Well, and mostly the southern Muslims. part is Christian. Yes. The Benue state is right in the middle, yeah. uh, but it's a majority Christian state. Yeah. The, the people who are doing the attacking of the villages, they're not Christians. They're not. Yeah. These are jihadists. Right. These are jihadists purely coming to Islamize 
call it to Fulanais, I call it to take over the land. Now, simple. Fulanais means it's, you're referring to the ethnicity called the Fulani, yes. which is about uh, maybe, what, 10 to 20 million of the 208 million Nigerians, right? Yeah. But uh, the, the Fulani people are diverse. Many are scholars. They're in the government. Uh, the president uh, is Fulani. Yeah. Uh, there are many public officials, uh, people serving in the, uh, the police, the army are, uh, you know, fighting against jihadists. They're mm -hmm. Fulani also. Yeah. So it's not it's not a, a mono it's not a monolithic group, right? Yeah. Who are the people who are attacking these villages? They are Fulani. Yeah. Like I said. It is a continuation of the jihad arrangement that was orchestrated by Othman Danfodio, who yeah. came from Futa Jelon in Senegal and decided to establish a caliphate in Sokoto, the far north of Nigeria, and launch a jihad that he will make Nigeria their own nation. But the history behind all this jihad arrangement to Fulanize and to Islamize is because they came together because they were mostly uh, herdsmen. Mm -hmm. So, but they came together and, according to them, discovered that they are on African soil, but they have no country they can call their own. And so they formed Nigeria over 200 years ago and decided that they will make Nigeria their own country. Right, and it, I think it was in 2019, Benue State Legislature, the lawmakers decided to put an end to open grazing, which meant that the uh, the large uh, herds of uh, being I, 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 I sent that bill to the House of Assembly. Right. It was my own way of finding a solution to expose to the outside world what these people are talking about, farmers head as crisis. Mm. And this has been achieved. Because the truth is that, you know, in America here, in Europe, in Asia, and other parts of the world where people uh, um, do animal husbandry. Right. It is true ranching. I did a study, and I confirmed this in several countries with the statistics with more people having, more countries having more um, um, livestock. But yet there are no crises. Go to Brazil. On record, we have over 250 million heads of cattle. And in India, the same thing, over 200 million heads of cattle. The whole cattle in Nigeria that you're hearing so much about farmers' head as crisis is not up to 30 million heads of cattle. Mm. So why is it so? And of course, for a, a country that believes in agriculture, and especially for my own state, that apart from the civil service economy, the next economy is the peasant farming that supports the civil service economy in my own state. Now, somebody has spent his life saving to invest in a farm, or and you bring your cattle to come and feed on the farm. What else do you expect the person who is the farmer to do? What's the typical response of the farmers when a herd of cattle comes in at harvest time and starts to decimate the Initially, the they resisted it but eventually they were killed. They were killed. They resisted it because nobody will want to watch right. and see that his saving for a whole year is gone. And so they resisted it. But these people have an agenda coming in with sophisticated weapons. AK-47, AK-49. And these people are the, are the these are the Fulani? They are the Fulanis. Uh, all of them. Yes. All of them are the Fulanis, you and know? And so they, 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 they come kill, and what they decided to do, because like I said, it is about taking over the land. Right. And ensuring that the whole place is Islamized. Even the Islam 
It is not that they want Islam to spread. The real agenda is to take over the land and make it their own in the 21st century. I don't know where in the world that anybody would think about that. Now, the federal but government has that. said repeatedly, like years ago, that they want to see ranching in Benue State, that they want to see ranching in the Middle Belt. So they're in favor of that. What progress has been made to uh, establish so-called cattle reserves? To show you that they have a plan against us and against me and against my state that they are, is as spoken. We have stood by the truth and told the whole world that what they are doing is wrong. When we uh, met at the National Economic Council, a decision was taken that states that want to do open grazing should go ahead. But for some of us that are insisting on ranching, let there be ranching. But you'll be amazed to hear from me that when this program came, money came from EU, the federal government also added money, and the states were nominated. And I also came into the program for ranching. But when money came, they gave it to Katsina. That is Mr. President's state. They so gave it to how much Adamo. money did they give to Benue for ranching? Nothing out there today. No mm -hmm. single naira have been given to Benue states. And so I had thought that we where the first state that proposed this ranching to be done. And we even went ahead and initiated and made a law in 2017, as you said. It was based after my research that I presented a bill, it was an executive bill to the State House of Assembly. And in 2017, it was passed and I signed. And I expected that if states were to be prioritized in giving this money, then we said it would have been one. Because I have a law in place. It is through the law that I we enacted that other state too keyed in. And today more than twenty states have also adopted the same method of ensuring open grazing is prohibited and provision is made for ranching. Now we've reported that Benway State has as many as two million uh, internal internally displaced people who many were on farms trying to farm and they've been moved off of their farms. Is this true? And so another question is who's providing, who's providing the uh, sustenance for the people in these so-called IDP camps? First of all, I want to tell you that these IDP camps are not standard IDP camps. These are primary schools. Mm -hmm. Some places they are churches. Mm -hmm. And some places they are uncompleted buildings. Right. And it is true that we have over two million IDPs. And ninety-nine percent of these people are the peasant farmers we had in Benue State. They're peasant farmers. Yeah. Yeah. And so but when these terrorist herdsmen come with the jihadist agenda, kill them, man rape women, rip up women's womb, bring out the embryo, and pieces it. And to just to pull fear into people and say that even when they kill you with their AK-47, they remove your head, they butcher you as if you are uh, an animal. And and it, sir, is this being accurately and frequently reported in Western media to your knowledge? Well, the, the, it's one of the things that uh, of recent I've been trying to uh, reach out to the Western media to understand because here the understanding it is that about climate change, so farmers had that crisis. It is beyond that. It is about taking over the entire country and making it a full and lean country. That is all that they are working towards. Not about any other thing. It is about taking over the country. So you have taken the step of encouraging the expansion of local neighborhood watch groups. They're, they exist in many states, maybe all states in Nigeria. And the neighborhood watch groups 
are men who try to defend their communities, sometimes with uh, primitive weapons. But you've taken a, the extra step and announced to the president, uh, President Muhammadu Buhari, who is himself a member of the Fulani tribe, you said that you need licenses for your volunteer guardsmen to carry AK-47s. What has been his response? Yeah, my community volunteer guards, uh, we have trained them properly and uh, also equipped them with legal weapons. And what are those weapons that they have? Uh, uh, pump action. Pump action shotguns. Barren. These are shotguns. Uh, um, yes. yes, shotgun, right. uh, you know, uh, machete. Right. Uh, which, are commonly, which are commonly used in the Middle Belt states all over Nigeria by community guardsmen. Uh, yeah, that is it. Uh, we, we are doing that. And, um, because we believe in the rule of law as much as possible. Because we know the implication of having a country that will be lawless, there will be anarchy, and then nobody is safe. Exactly. So as much as possible, I believe in the rule of law. I use the conventional security apparatus of the state. As I talk to you, my volunteer guards are working closely with the security men in Benue State. In fact, the police stations uh, is the armory for these volunteer guards. Now may I ask, uh, when you say the security men in Benue State, are you referring to the police or the military? Police, or the military, the Air Force, okay. all the sons. Okay. Um, and I commend them. They will be doing their best. But it's just that they are ill-equipped. Mm -hmm. They have no capacity in terms of manpower. And funding is a problem because most of them we do the funding at the state level for them to be able to give us adequate security. Now, do you fund the volunteer guards only, or do you also provide funding for the security men, including the police and the army? Of course, we do, we do it. The vehicles they have, logistics for mm -hmm. movement and all that. I sponsor because the federal government, whether they sponsor or for whatever reason, we don't see it. So I take the responsibility because it's my state and I want security, I want peace for my state and without which you cannot do anything. And so I taking that responsibility but my volunteer guys, they work alongside with the conventional security, with rules of engagement. And I tell you, we just started uh, to weeks ago, they arrested some uh, militia from Cameroon who are fighting. They found their way into Benue State and they were arrested and given that there are pockets of crime that these volunteer guards have already uh, prehended those involved and handed them over to police. Now this militia from Cameroon, what who, what kind of people were they? Were they uh, ethnics? They are Cameroonians. There are ethnic. You know there are ethnic problems right now between the Anglophone and the Francophone. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking uh, indigenous of uh, Cameroon. There's fighting. There is war in Cameroon. So, but the cross, I am having over 12,000 refugees in Benue State from Cameroon. Hmm. Yeah. Now, regarding the, 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 the law enforcement efficacy, uh, in some other states that Epic Times has covered these massacres, the response time of police and military to the attacks has been quite long. For example, uh, uh, sometimes police, sometimes the army actually doesn't respond to an attack until the next day. But what's what's typically the response time to of police and military after an attack in, in Benue State? And I believe there was a very unfortunate bloody attack that killed uh, five people just last week in your local government's area. How quickly did the re police respond? No, I must say that um, they are doing their best. But their best is not enough. And as governor and as uh, chairman of the Security Council in the state, I understand the challenges they have. Logistics, I provide, but it's not enough. 
the federal government does, but it's not adequate. And the worst thing is the manpower. They don't have the manpower to be stationed in those flashpoint areas so that if anything comes, they can respond immediately. Sometimes they have to travel uh, from a distance of 10 kilometers. Sometimes they travel a distance of over 20 kilometers to get to the scene. And for criminals and for terrorists and for jihadists who are perpetuating this act, they always have their own intelligence to ensure that the security men are not around in that place. If they attack today, tomorrow they will go to another place. Right. So currently what is happening in my state is like guerrilla attacks. And because even the community volunteer guys are not yet enough and equipped to be able to contain these terrorists. So that is what is happening. Is so, this violent, but is this violence different from the attacks of Boko Haram or the Islamic State in West Africa that we're fam familiar with in the northeast part of the country? Well, I can tell you from my own information that uh, Boko Haram, ISIS, Israel, and Fulani terrorists, they are working for the same agenda. It's the same group of people working together. How do they work together? Can you give us the specific examples of their collaboration? They collaborate by providing arms to them mm -hmm. and doing the same thing by killing, just like the Bible says, the thief coming on, but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So I have seen this collaboration mm -hmm. in all this group. They are doing the same thing, nobody should lie. And of course, if you talk about Boko Haram, what is the meaning of saying, uh, Western education is bad when they are using Western equipment and even speaking Western language and doing the same thing that is happening. What is this point? Stopping people from going to church, killing pastors, kidnapping people, collecting ransom. It's the same style. They are doing the same thing. So for me, all of them are grouped into one to achieve the same agenda of Islamizing and flanizing. Now, do they? Do you see that they have a concerted effort, a collaboration to affect the elections in Nigeria in February of next year? Do they want people to vote a certain way, or do they want to stop the elections, or what? Well, um, the agenda is to Islamize and to flanize, and I, I see that collaboration happening. And it is unfortunate that today uh, the two major political parties, they have elements of that. One, uh, the APC have the, the Muslim, APC Muslim ticket. The, the, uh, the, can you define that? That's the All Progressives? APC All Progressives Congress. Which used to be your party. Yes, which used to be my own party. Mm -hmm. But because of these constant killings and attack on my people, and I left, mm -hmm. I came into uh, PDP, that is People's Democratic Party. Yes. That was my original party in the first place. But when I did not get nomination in PDP in 2015, I left for APC and won my election. Mm -hmm. But when this terrorist activity started, and I pleaded, and gave my advice, I, could have, I came back to PDP and won my election in 2019. So the All Progressive Congress, they have a Muslim Muslim ticket. Muslim presidential candidate and Muslim um, uh, vice president are running. What sort of impact has that had on the, the voters? To have a Muslim, uh, both a Muslim presidential candidate and a uh, also a, a running, mate. running mate also m Muslim. Is that uh, out of character uh, with well, the Nigerian tradition? Yeah, for Nigeria, as you rightly said, in the north is predominantly uh, uh, Muslim. Muslims. In the middle bed and the south is predominantly Christians. So it has always been this kind of balancing 
religion because religion is a major factor in Nigeria. You cannot wish it away with a wave of hand. And so it is customary and in the unwritten constitution that this has to be done. And there should be rotation of presidency. All these are creating a lot of ripples back home in Nigeria. Now, you come back to People's Democratic Party, the party that I belong to. The candidate is a Muslim Fulani man uh, with a Christian running mate. So that looks better, but the challenge is handing over to another Fulani man. But that is my party. And so I never supported it, but I was overwhelmed. I never supported uh, another candidate again working to take over from Buhari, but now the majority of the party people overwhelmed me and I, 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 I remain in PDP and I, I have to work for it. But, but this year there's a new party, I mean there's a, a newer party, the Labour Party, and the, the presidential candidate is a, uh, an Igbo, a Roman Catholic man named Peter Obi, and he's shaking up the uh, participation in the campaigning this year. What sort of impact is that having? Happening. Well, Peter Obi is a good man. I know him. Mm -hmm. uh, former governor, very moderate uh, personality. Who uh, I think, if given the opportunity, he can do well. Um, but the challenge is the structure of the party to work with. Uh, as a Christian, and looking at my own history. Uh, as a politician, uh, especially in from when I won election as local government chairman, as a believer, and of course in uh, 2015, how I became governor of my state, when I had several people working against me, the government did possible, and of course in 2019, all forces from the federal might from ministers' might, from all sorts of might were against me, but I won the election. And I've always tried to say this, despite all that is happening. Let us pray and work hard. For those of us who are politicians, who work hard, but at the end, it's God that we decide. Because John 3.27 says, a man can receive nothing except is given to him from above. So God is able to make that happen. For me, I'm working for PDP, but I believe that uh, God will decide who will take over in 2023, because the church is praying. We are praying. And I tell you today, uh, the entire church is not happy with this present government, and is not happy that some people want to make Nigeria an Islamic country. We should be a secular country where everybody is free. There should be religious freedom where people should participate in whatever religion. And that is what I believe in my state. I have never had any Christian since over seven years as governor. I have never had any issue of religious crisis in my state. And the reason is that I involve everybody. You want to be a Christian, you can be there. If a Christian wants to preach to a Muslim to convert to Christianity, that is his business. If a Muslim wants to preach to a Christian to convert, that is their own business too. So I, I, I think that uh, 2023 is loaded. Uh, let nobody deceive you. But I believe that God's hand will be upon Nigeria. But at the same time, We've seen in the last two years increasing incidences of atrocities, uh, Muslim attacks in the Middle Belt, and we've seen uh, terrible blasphemy murders like the uh, awful blasphemy killing of Deborah Emanuel on uh, May uh, uh, 12th in uh, Sokoto. Uh, we've seen uh, many other cases of uh, terrible attacks and uh, religious riots in Joss. When you Look at the big picture, where Nigeria is going, say, in the next five years. 
when looking ahead, say, to uh, you know, 20, uh, 2027 or beyond, based on your life experience and what you've seen happening in the Middle Belt, what is Nigeria going to look like in five years? Five years, uh, for me, I'm looking forward that God will intervene and help us with our active participation. One message that I've given to the church today, back home in Nigeria, is that faith without works is dead. As we pray, as we have faith that God is able to do it, let us also stand up to our responsibility and make things work. God will give us the necessary support. If the situation continues the way it is today, if nothing is changed, I tell you there will be no more Nigeria. What would it, instead of Nigeria, what would it look like? What will we have instead? It, 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 there will be anarchy, there will be lawlessness everywhere, and then it will be terrible because currently, as I talk to you, I have requested that President Muhammad Buhari should grant me a license to arm my community volunteer guards mm -hmm. with AK-47. I'm ready to buy those arms. But because I'm a law-abiding personality, otherwise, a lot of states now have decided to be lawless. They have not cared to ask for a legitimate license. But they are acquiring arms, sophisticated ones just like that of the foreigners, so that uh, they, they will continue killing. And if that happens, then nobody will be safe again. And so I tell you, there will be lawlessness and then anarchy will come in because the truth is that if you're disarming legitimate people, who want peace and who want to protect themselves, and you're not disarming the foreigners, and they are coming in to kill the people. I mean, the, that is sad not uh, to, to govern a country. And I tell you that I can assure you, if nothing is done, there's going to be lawlessness. There will be anarchy, and uh, it's going to be terrible on uh, Europe, and America especially, because even America here, you have a lot of uh, Nigerians. They have their siblings, they have their relations. They will find ways of coming into America. In Europe, it will be the same thing. Whether through legal means or illegal means, they will find ways of coming here. And that will be a disaster for this America that is God-fearing, it will be a disaster for them. The kind of challenge you have, you will not be able to cope. The refugees that you have in America here will be terrible. And that is why I keep saying that whatever Americans can do to put a word to mm -hmm. the government that is in place to advise them. Uh, let them know that America is also watching. I know Nigeria is a sovereign country. You can't just move against them. I know that uh, in Europe, there are sovereign countries, and they know Nigeria is a sovereign country, they can't move, but by way of various treaties that Nigeria have entered with in the international community, yes, they can have a way of persuading or advising or making a peace for them to do the right thing. I tell you, the challenge we have in Nigeria today is as a result of lawlessness. People have refused and this is from the leadership itself because they When you say it's from the leadership itself, who are you referring to? Uh, of course, uh, who is our leader today? The president? Yeah, his of administration. Course they, okay. uh, the president and his management. Hmm. Yeah, they are complicit because what is happening in Nigeria today would have been contained. What is happening in Nigeria today would have been solved. If the constitution of our country was respected. If the rule of law was respected, irrespective of whosoever was involved. That is not the case. Now, do you see that this breakdown law of law and order would spread to surrounding countries like Benin, Ghana? Yeah, Ghana. gradually that is where we have gotten to. There's general breakdown of law and order. And the, 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 the country of over 
um, uh, 200 million, you have less than 500,000 policemen. I mean, it, 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 it does not add up anywhere in the world uh, where you have pockets of criminal activities going on uh, with these terrorists coming from Mauritania, from Senegal, from uh, Chad, from Cameroon, from Ghana, from uh, uh, Niger, and attacking our people. And I've I, I, I been here for uh, several times. I hardly see any military man on the street. Today, the police in Nigeria are overwhelmed. It is the military that have been able to bring some level of sanity. But because they are also overwhelmed, it's becoming a general problem. And uh, when they give up, the, the whole country is gone. Everybody will take arms against each other. And then we don't know where we'll be. That is my fear. So in five years, even less than five years' time, I see a, a lot of challenges arising from these security problems that I have analyzed here. And the action of government at the center, where the, the, the action and inaction have clearly shown some of us that they are complicit. And that is why I told them, arising from what happened in Afghanistan, I said that one day the president will run away from Dandila and hand over to terrorists. And it didn't take time when the president convoy was attacked in his own home state. It did take time when the prison was invaded by these terrorists and all the inmates were released. It did take time when Brigade of That was guns, the invasion, that was the takeover of the Kujie prison. Of yes. Yeah, in Abuja, you know? right, yes. And it did not take time in the same Abuja where the presidential guards we are invaded and some killed. So these are the issues. By the grace of God, God has given me the insight and once it's given to me, I'm not afraid to say it. I have given legitimate advice and whatever I say, it is meant to help the country to move to greater height. Mm. I am not afraid of saying it, but it's purely ways of advising them. If they have taken my advice would have been very far. I have recommended security summit, call all the stakeholders, all the governors and other stakeholders and experts who sit together to do it. And you will be amazed that nobody have given a thought to this. And this is how many years, more than three years that I've been calling for this security summit. And this has this idea of the security summit ever been echoed or supported by the U.S. State Department? Well, but well, well, you see, if, if, if they do that and they're able to convince our president and the federal government to have that, it will be a perfect arrangement that we will just... But they are afraid to do that. For me, I have accused them of complicity. They are afraid. Who's they? I mean, that would be... The president. The federal government. The federal yeah. government. They and are afraid because them. they are complicit. There are things that, if you call a security summit, and some of us, we open up. Hmm. I have documents, all these things I have reported to federal government several times. The invasion in my state, I have reported to federal government several times, but I have not had any response from them, including the application for uh, license to purchase uh, automatic weapons. Uh, this is how many months. This is a very serious thing that I expected that by now would have gotten a response. I have not gotten it. And so when I look at all this, I say that these people are complicit. Governor Ortum, we thank you for a frank and candid uh, report on what's the cause of the violence and the way, uh, the, the way out of this morass. And we, we thank you. We're out of time, but we hope to talk to you again for Epic Times uh, TV and for Burton News and Views. We wish you well in your efforts to end the genocide against Christians and other religious minorities in, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, I'm your host you. for Epic Times TV with Samuel uh, Ortum. Uh, I'm Doug Burton.